this is KP Rao presenting a few thoughts on languages and linguistics, basically from the Indian point of view, accepting that uh, we are aware of all the rest of the good things that are happening to language and linguistics abroad. And we want to involve them also in our discussion. From the Indian point of view, all languages are supposed to have started from Brahma himself. And then they should have, they have come down all the way through Brihaspati and other things to us. But what is surprising about that is most of the languages of India have learned a lot from the so-called Sanskrit or a refined language that was the lingua franca of many an educated man at least till about 7th or 8th century AD, right from about 7 or 8th centuries before Christ. The effort is to just list, list out the possibilities and wonder how such a thing has happened. One of the important things that happened was the, a lot of text was available in the northwest India or Gandhara, which is the present Afghanistan, or the northwestern Pakistan area, which was considered to be the mother of all the kinds of text that has been written in India over time. These were the works called the Vedas, and they were written in a proto-Asian language in that sense. And we know that this formed the basis for the language Sankrit. The language Sanskrit itself has a bit of a history of the present. The word Sanskrit itself was a derivation of 9th century AD by a grammarian of uh, India. But then the original word that existed for the language post Vedas was Bhasha or Brahmi or Bharati or anything of that kind. One of the words that is used, which we prefer to call it as Girvana, which technically means a refined and writable language in that sense. Vani means the voice. Gir is a standard word for writing. So it is a writable language that we are going to talk about is Girvana. The original language itself was very complex and very ancient. This needed a refinement before it could be a language that could be learned and a lang language that can be taught. So our effort is to trace the history of this. And I have a mad assumption to say that it could be someone like Vedavyasa, a learned man of those times who did this job, the basic job of collecting all the text that was available in this proto language of the time called the Vedic language now sometimes also known as Vedic Sanskrit. This language, once the text was available, this language underwent a bit of modification and improvement, especially for the purpose of archiving information that was available at that particular time, and also as a language that could be learned and taught. Possibly, this formed the core language of Takshashila University, a university in different terms or different applications, which lasted between about 8th century BC and got itself dissolved somewhere around about 2nd century BC. The alumni of this institution were great, especially the last of the important person that grammarians that came in this happened to be Panini. And once Panini touched the language and did all the modifications and codification of the language in his uh, book of grammar, virtually that became the language standard and a grammar standard for the entire lot of languages which were in that particular area. Most of my talk is reserved and sort of is going to talk about this as we go by. We also have a some other grammarians of those times that we are going to talk about. A very important grammarian happened to be Apishili, 
a person who had a theory of language and wondered what the entire thing was about. In a very short time that is available at the end of this uh, main topic that I have, we are trying to expand and extend Apicelli's theory to wonder whether that could be applicable to all forms of language like the language of dance, the language of music and the language of writing or anything else that is there. In addition to the language of speech or the spoken language to which it was applicable according to Apicelli. Bear with me and have a spare about an hour to listen to whatever that I have to sort of present in later. Those of you who are experts in languages and Indian studies might be can skip the first 30 minutes where I am talking mostly about the theory of language as an Indian would understand it, basically as a derivative of from the linguistic point of view of the West as it goes now. Go ahead with the, the story. The present lecture also is about languages. This is a continuation in a way from the last lecture that I have uploaded. That was on the written language and Brahmi for that matter, all on paleography, how the Brahmi script got invented, how that worked and how that affected all the other scripts and writing systems of India is what I said in the last video that I prepared and uploaded. What I am going to have today is an extension of that. It is a modification, one step further from that, basically to talk about language, especially the spoken language, as it goes with from the Indian point of view all the time. We will be referring to some European and other concepts of language, but the Indian rishis and Indian thinkers did a lot of homework and lot of uh, let's say theoretical work on these kinds of things, even as early as 10 centuries BC. And we'll try to use those kinds of information to develop what we have. We talk again about language. We start with the first recorded linguistic records, language records that we have, the Vedas. The language used in the Vedas also is not a current language. It is a very ancient language. So call it a proto-language in that particular sense. And technically, it is also known as anonymous language, a language where there is no single creator for Vedas, no single author, but then maybe it is a community's contribution to language. And whatever that is gone at that particular time, it's uh, in Sanskrit we call it aparusheya not done by man at all kind of a thing, which can carry much deeper meanings. But I am trying to simplify it as anonymous, a language without a founder or an author. That leaves us with the responsibility of finding some authors for a derivative of that kind of a thing called the language of gods, which again is a uh, sort of a transliteration, a translation of a thing called Deva Bhasha. Let me just talk a bit about languages themselves in here. We call Sanskrit as a language here, but the word Sanskrit for a language was a much later derivative. It was invented only in 9th century AD by Dandi in his Kavyadarsha. He called the language, the refined language that exists as Sanskrit. And he also compared it to Prakrit, the common man's language and so many things. So the name Sanskrit itself did not exist when it became the language of the gods. So if I use Sanskrit, it is in very loose terms, we use it at that particular thing. So the language of the gods that itself got developed and sort of came into Og in those particularly early years. It also led to languages of men. Most of the Indian languages that we have got have their grammar, derived and also they contributed a few words to the language of the gods, especially when the language of the gods was used as a language of men, both in Kavya, poetry and all other variations of the things that went at that particular time. That's why I'm calling this entire uh, lecture itself by a very peculiar name 
called From a Language Anonymous to the Language of the Gods. That is the title of the um, thing itself. What we really want to discuss here is basically the standardization of a language, how the language that was being used at Takshashila University or any other establishment at that particular time, how it got standardization, what is essential for standardizing is a language is what we are going to talk about in some detail. There are a few explanations for the language itself that I have to tell you here. One of them comes from Advaita, Advaita Vedanta of India, talks about a Mahavakya called Aham Brahmasmi. I am the creator of my own world kind of a thing. What exactly it means and what its implications are was one of the first studies that I did. And I came across a very peculiar alternate. The human brain starts recording its information and uses it as a communication medium, builds its own language over time. Let me give you some very peculiar and difficult examples that we have at a later time. When a child is born, it does not carry a language of its own, excepting that it starts using its cry as a way of asking for the attention of people. And when it gets the attention of the people, that becomes a language, it becomes a dialogue. The person who receives or hears the child crying knows that he has to interact and comes and helps and does whatever that is necessary. So a language, a kind of understanding between the two develop. But accepting for this, the spoken language itself, a child develops over time. And the entire concept of the world, all the knowledge of the world, the world is recreated in the child's brain. And that is why the world that the child has created is its own. That is what exactly is meant by Aham Brahmasmi. It does not mean that I create someone else's world kind of a thing. I create my own world. Everyone's world is independent. That's why Brahma technically only means the algorithm by which we create the image of the world in your brain, in the sort of recordings on the neurons or whatever it is that happens. It is nothing much more. Now, if this kind of a sort of a Brahma, if I have to communicate with someone else, or one person has to communicate with another person, then we start with the problem as to how this communication can happen. Obviously, there has to be words spoken. These words have to be heard and understood. And the way of understanding a word and the way of creating a word are very similar. They have to use mirror images of the same algorithm. One generates it, the other recreates it. And that is what the entire process of language creation is, as we understand. There are a lot of theories that are associated with that. We'll go by all of them as we go, one by one. I was really thrilled and inspired by a very interesting episode that happened very recently. In an orphanage in uh, Romania, they had one Dr. George Muller was studying the orphanages of Europe from a big uh, foundation or sort of big money that she got from a J.T. Rowling's foundation, which was supposed to improve the lot of the orphanages in Europe. That's the purpose. Her observation was something very odd. When she went to the campus or the orphanage, they found it was surprisingly very quiet, according to her. She was wondering that she went around and found there are children and the things in their cribs. Each one is making all kinds of unintelligible noises, but no one really cries aloud. Someone, some of the children had wetted their nappies, but still there was no call or there was no worry. Why such a thing is happening is what surprised her. Then she found that if a child is newly admitted to the orphanage, the child keeps crying and shouting. And after some time, when the child finds that it is of no use, 
crying, it just goes quiet. That is exactly the thing that I was looking for. In the language that the child would have created for itself, now gets a stop when there are no listeners. There are no people who will associate any kind of a meaning to the step that is taken. That is one of the interesting things that happened. Very similarly, Patricia Kuhl, another scientist from U US, has done a lot of work on with all modern gadgets, trying to find out with fMRI what exactly happens in a person's or a child's mind when something is spoken to her or when she listens to some kind of a thing. We are referring to a child. There are some very interesting results again that came up. If a child is talked by its Japanese mother in Japanese, the child creates a template as it were just to identify the different phonemes that are used in the Japanese and she can easily reproduce at a later time the kind of sounds that the child has heard. If it is an American mother talking to the child in English, again the phonemes that are used in English are recorded on the template of the child's mind and its response only to those specific phonemes that are recorded matter. They do not, they just are, don't respond, respond to that. If you know, in Japanese, the R and L sounds are sort of mixed into one and Japanese children cannot distinguish between R and L when they start speaking or when they listen to a language. The same thing is true about the R and L which are identified by the English or the English speaking American children and the same sort of a story continues even in that level of a language. This is one of the things that I wanted to talk about that the brain itself is conditioned for certain sounds and certain languages and it creates its own template for a language that it is going to speak at a later time. It speaks, listens to it, tests that with the template that it has got, if it is not up to the mark, repeats it till it is identified and recorded. That is how the entire process of speech generation in a child's brain happens. To make it simple, the child has created its own language for speaking and for listening to. This is one of the important things that I wanted to tell about this kind of a thing. It is also true that Twins develop a language of their own quite often. They sort of develop within themselves a private language which no third person will ever understand or it's difficult for a third person to understand. We have known cases where identical twins speak to each other in a coded language about everyone around except, oh, excepting the two of them no one else understands. So it is possible to create a totally private and communicative language, again to mean that you are the Brahma of your own Brahmi that goes. That's one of the things that I had to tell you. I was studying some 20 grammarians. These 20 grammarians were uh, from Sankrit grammarians. They were either contemporaries of Panini or lived earlier to Panini. Some of them have been referred to by Panini and some of them have been referred to by grammarians of a later time like Patanjali and all have referred to these grammarians. Their work and whatever they had done is what I want to sort of talk about at a later time but that is one of the things that we have got. At this particular moment I will talk only about one person, Audumbarayana who says that a mouth, in his word, the cantabila actually, can produce the vocal cord or the vocal system of the human beings, is capable of producing many sounds and variations. And they can be classified or put into three groups. One of them is known as Udgara, a sort of a immediate reaction to an impulse which may or may not carry a meaning. In most cases, it does not carry a meaning like a cough or a sneeze or 
a blurb or anything of that kind. But then Udghosha, using a meaningless sound to create a meaning, this create an action or initiate an action is possible. That is the second level of a use for the language, in which typically we call someone else by a sort of a just a word which does not carry a meaning. Or if you take about, talk about the Romanian kids, the cry of the child itself is a udghosha. It is a deliberate attempt to put a word or a sound which can associate itself with a meaning but does not carry a meaning as it is. There is no universality of that kind of a thing. This is the udghosha part of it. Then comes a bhasha, something which is meant for a conversation and a dialogue. When the language itself develops even further, it can go into at least two or three different levels of communication. One of them is creating a poem or sing, putting it in a metrical order, putting whatever that you have to say into a musical system. All those things get become possible at different times. So that is an extension. Another of our friend, J.F. Stahl, which uh, <laughs> we all know, the one who initiated our uh, yajnas in Kerala once upon a time, he had a concept that the language also can go into a ritual level, that there can be a total deviation from the original purposes. It can be used as a community language for a celebration, a ornamentation of a language and also things are possible, is what he had studied and made possible at that particular time. Another of the characteristics of a language is language is a behavioral pattern. This can be taught and it can be learned. It's unlike many of the bodily things that happen. You don't know how to digest things. You can't control it. <laughs> you can sort of be affected by it. It is not something that has been derived as a part of your body, but it is something else that you learn. All languages, as I told you, right from the Udghosha or Udgara or any other level of a language can be taught and it can be learned. This is a third important characteristic of a language. It is a behavioral pattern that can be done and it can also sort of recursively improve. That is, you can speak in that language, you can hear that in a group and then it is possible to improve upon it. All these kinds of things happen. Now, this is the approximate definition of the languages that I had, excepting that I want to talk also about a few other things, which I will skip for the time being. Basically, the spoken language also has a few other special implications that are involved. There is the phonetics, there is the phonemics, there is the morphology, there is the syntax, and the semantics and pragmatics. Indian scientists, and Indian grammarians have worked on all these kinds of things at different times, all much, much, much before anyone from the West really worked on it. I got a history of what they did on languages at that particular time. English language itself got standardized only in about 12th to 14th century. Finally, it came into a total format only after Johnson's dictionary was created. Till that time, it didn't exist that time. Arabic itself got standardized only in about 7th century AD and not earlier. Latin, they tried to push into some earlier things, but the first available record is from about 1st century BC kind of a thing and not earlier. So all these things, with all those things concerned, the phonetics and the concept of a language and understanding language and creating language, the cognition, the cognitive portion of the language itself was studied in India as early as about 8th or 10th century BC. But what followed is something very odd. Virtually no work has happened after about 10th or 12th centuries. They were all trying to flash back on trying to comment and understand whatever has happened earlier and not go any further. Will not bother so much about it as that kind of a thing. There is a Another aspect of uh, all these kinds of things basically is the regionalization, especially when it is still it is properly documented and standardized. 
there can be huge lot of variations between languages between one area and that other even nearby areas can have a lot of distinction and difference in languages and will speak and try to understand how that got affected and what is exactly required for standardization then again something like the 8th century bc they formed a university in india called takshashila university this thrived and worked great till about 4th century or 3rd century bc finally sort of got dissolved for so many reasons let's not get into those details anyway but led to the formation of a proper university called nalanda university which came up later the part of takshashila university there are many things to be said about takshashila university the alumni of this institution who sort of worked there include the great chanakya and so many others charaka and the last of them and the most important of them was panini almost all the grammarians the 20 grammarians that i'm going to talk about worked or were in this institution at different times and contributed to the development of the language what exactly they did and what exactly was required to do such a thing and what they worked on is what i'm going to talk in the next few minutes one of the most important requirement for standardization of any language is a corpus of words a collection of words some available literature and possibly from that create a dictionary standardize on them preferably have a thesaurus to say that these words are similar meaning identical meaning you can use them recursively you can use interchangeably in those kinds of conditions then obviously the entire work and management of uh, language happens it works out perfectly that way what was the text that was available especially in the 8th century or 10th century bc the only text that was available to us was the anonymous text that i told you about the vedic text what language it is used we really do not know but now we approximate that to be a vedic language a proto devabhasha for that matter a proto bhasha something which has not been derived and which also required a lot of reworking in that kind of a sense the question is who did it and how they did it kind of a thing i have a peculiar sort of a reason and a theory to say this that i attribute all this to a big language office that existed at takshashila university who had or a librarian for that matter or a library office whose main job was to collect all these linguistic items that are necessary to create a lingua franca a language which can be taught that can be learned that can be standardized in which you can create your literature and even the most sophisticated kind of literature that is possible this was taken up by the office called vyasa whom we later call vedavyasa and will come to him and go into some discussions of what he did one of the wonders of the world today is that the vedas especially the rigveda is being spoken and pronounced and spoken almost the same way as it was being repeated some 10 centuries before christ even today how was this miracle possible vedavyasa or this library office found there were two possibilities one was to write them down or provide a lot of symbols for the sounds that were available and then save them that way the scripts that were available 10 centuries before christ in and around the region of where the vedic text was found are very rudimentary they almost did not exist or they were not standardized or they were not adequate enough to catch all the sounds and phonemes that went into the vedic language so it was in such a time that they found that the only way to do it is to recite it learn it by learn it learn it by heart 
and have it recorded and created in such a way that there will not be any change and modification and alteration that will be possible any time. How to do it? They created an absolutely foolproof system at that particular time. This was known as the way of reciting and sort of listen to it, correct yourself, go for a group recitations and then continue with this kind of a thing. If someone as great a man as Veda Vyasa, when he sought as, sat at this, they devised the first part of the system as this. There is a text or there is a content of the Vedas available and they are available in many dialects. Possibly every 10 kilometers there was a difference in the language. Each society and each community forms its own language that need not be identical to another language, but it can be very similar to the other languages that are there. And it is in these circumstances that they wanted to standardize and understand what the entire thing is about. He possibly sent his volunteers into different regions, different families, maybe at different times, but just insisted on learning by heart the content. Instead of just learning it by heart as it is, which is known as the Sanghita Pata as we have now, he also developed two more systems. One of them obviously is the Pada Pata and the third is the Krama Pata. Pada Pata in particular segments all the compound words that are used in the Vedic text and tries to recombine them in different orders as required in Kramapata and a later kind of a thing. Kramapata is a way of memorizing the content, the segmented portion of the text, but then reassembling them was left to the Samhita. That itself was an exercise by itself, going beyond all doubts. In addition to that, they also started working on some rudimentary steps of a grammar as to how the words have to be combined, what are the rules for combining the phonemes that are available or the phonemics of that kind of a thing that are available. And all these things were sort of decided and put in the grammars of that time. Unfortunately, none of them are available as they are till we almost come to Panini or it is otherwise. There are two things that have been said about Panini. Once Panini came into the picture, all earlier grammars virtually were forgotten because they found it all irrelevant because this is the absolute perfect codification of the content that was possible. Not only that, even today, if you have to reconstruct the Vedic phonology or the Vedic phonemics or the Vedic grammar, we depend on Panini's rules of exceptions that he has got for his rules. After defining a rule, Panini says these are the exceptions because these have occurred in Vedic works. So we say that, okay, in Vedic terms, they have these kinds of words, kind of a thing. Even grammar has to be reworked from Panini's work and not from any other earlier work. That's one of the very interesting things that happens in this. Anyway, that was one. The, one of the most important things that happened, which for which we really do not know, any kind of a resemblance and meaning happens from a shiksha, another system that sort of went by. What exactly the shikshas were, we do not know. But we know approximately that these were the collection of punims and how the punims have to be used in defining or reciting Sankrit of that particular time, the language of that particular time and the content of the Vedas at that kind of, a, kind of a thing. For we still are in a doubt whether the shikshas refer to one group or one gotra or each of those multiple dialects had different, we, uh, we did they have different kind of uh, shiksha granthas or shiksha rules, we do not know. But what we know today is that there are at least some 70 to 80 of the Shiksha Granthas have been made available thanks to all the electronic media that is available, that are available to virtually anybody. But 
all of them approximately have the same kind of a content. They go with the same kind of a rules. All of them start with uh, the, almost the Paninian way, start with phonemics, just to say that these are the phonemes that are going to be used in whatever that follows kind of a thing. How the phonemes combine themselves, or the phone phonemics, the basic phonemes combine themselves to form words and how they associate that themselves later kind of a thing. When I started working on it, I had a surprise of my lifetime. The simple uh on which my earlier presentation was based can be pronounced in 71 different ways. Just if a I is followed by a k or a I is followed by another kind of a sound, the way that affects the basic word, the basic sound, the vowel that is going to present it itself is different was an eye opener to me. We could never believe that. But fortunately or unfortunately, they dropped it out and we didn't go any further. Again, the, after this basic kind of text was sort of collected and recited and recorded, they went for the next step that had to go. This work was taken up by people who were parallel to the Vyasa office and they were not a part of the Vyasa office, but they worked differently. The greatest of them happens to be Yaska, who came in, some according to some in 8th century BC and according to some others in 6th century BC. Does not matter who, when he came. His concept was something different. First thing that he started with was a Vedic collection of words, a collection of words that are used in the Vedas. They call them Nighantu. It is, he, Yaska actually refers to Nighantu Va. Many books of such things, collections of words that existed even earlier. The one that I was just referring to earlier, the Shamana Shiksha, the earliest, the one that talked about the variations of A, could have been another of such kind of a Nigantava, we don't know. The authors of the Nigantava have not been mentioned. It just comes from the Vedic collection. For all that I know, it was again provided by the Veda office, the Veda Vyasa's office or the Vyasa's office, who could use all these kinds of words, the Nigunta could have been created by them. And based on that, they try to build all other kind of languages that are necessary at a later time. All the steps that went by are very, very simple. Basically, it is the morphological rules, how the phonemes have to be combined and everything and how the words have to be created, the syntax creation kind of also was sort of went on for a long time. There are two grammarians that I want to mention here of great importance. One of them is again Audumbarayana, who defines that all words that are spoken contain of two elements, a, an element of a consonant and a element of a swara or a vowel, which sort of everyone in the world agrees now, but this was about 7th century BC, that he had to put such a word. Then he defines these, uh, the very, uh, the, both the terms, and that is what is surprising. He says, the swaras or the vowels are the ones which can be spoken in different levels of time, different units of time. It can be very short to very long. It can take a second for sort of the same sound could be produced or it could be one. Consonant has only a passing existence. It is only a chaya existence. It is a shadow-like existence. It just starts as a small variation of the karana, the unit that produces it. But then it requires a swara for that, a vowel to be pronounced and spoken, finally to be understood and heard. This is a very difficult part of phonology that we have to talk about. But then I have tested it in every other possible way and we found that it is absolutely true. Just to give a small example, if you say key for a long time, what remains is e and not ka anymore. If you say ka or a ka, 
whatever be the length of what remains in the vowel, the consonant itself is forgotten and gone. This kind of a distinction was found even in those times and they have recorded it that way. This obviously puts us to a simple question, how many vowels and how many consonants are required? Personally, I found a very interesting answer for this in a Taittiriya of Tati Shakya, again a work which is uh, something parallel to talk about how uh, the Taittiriya group recited their Vedas kind of a thing. They decided that there will be nine sounds that are there. By the earlier definition, Audumaraya's definition, what are those nine sounds which sort of get extended or shortened in their own ways at different levels of time? Panini's own sutras, the sutra, the earliest of the sutras talks about I, E, Wu and Rilik and A, O, Ch and that kind of a thing. There are only five of them which are being talked about because the short and long are the same vowel. It does not change excepting that length of the uh, sort of prescription changes, the, the original length remains the same. What is that kind of a thing? Found that my uh, mother tongue, Tulu, has at least three more sounds which are used. Very often in addition to the a, E, U, A, O kind of thing, the A and the A, the Vivruta or the Samruta kind of a thing, and the U, a short sound for the A. Surprised that all these eight finally match the nine that are mentioned by the Intitated Pratishakya as the sounds. I also was, this is the eye opener to me in another way. The commentators on Taittiriya Pratishakya, who had done the great work in commenting on them at a later time, for that to be understood, missed the bus that they try to fit it between the three lengths of time, the nine, and sort of got nowhere. That was one of the unfortunate things. But then, if you just say that each language or each kind of region has a language, the language has its own specific and personal kind of vowels that it takes. That is true also about the consonants. This has been uh, also is a matter of discussion to an extent. When it comes to the bhasha, the Paninia bhasha, he has sort of listed out the consonants that he is going, is going to use. They have been absolutely identified as different locations, the ka, ka, ga, ga, and all of them have been put into the proper varga that has been done. But still, there are a few sounds which are used in Vedas, which are not a part of Paninian rule, or they are not being mentioned in any one of the, the other shikshas that are there. The reason could be something very simple. Well, it is not being used, that's all. If for some reason you try to use only a ka and never a ga, in your language, or a ghe, a heavier, explosive version of that, then you don't need it. That is how the number of consonants that you use and the number of vowels that you use are specific to a region and a particular language. The sounds that are used in Arabic may not be required and may not be used in Kannada or Hindi or Sanskrit or any other language that exists, and all such things are possible. That's one of the reasons why we say that at a later time, one of the first jobs in doing a work on a language or specifying a language is selection of those kinds of phonemes that are there. We come back from this particular point again to Takshashila. What exactly happened at Takshashila after this? What did the grammarians do? In a course of time, I want to put all these 20 grammarians in a proper time scale and if possible, and if my energy permits and if I live that long, I want to sort of put all their work, their personal contributions at different levels. All of them have contributed greatly to development of this language, even to pragmatics. Possibly one of the most famous pragmatic rules that goes is from Shakatayana. There were two Shakatayanas, incidentally, the earlier Shakatayana, there is Jaina Shakatayana and a um, sort of a non-Jaina Chakatayana, an earlier one, 
who says that all nouns have been derived from verbal roots. So <laughs> verbal roots lead to all nouns was his famous rule, which has been disputed, but it can't be questioned. It's true in many of the cases. If you just go for the real roots in that sense, it matters a lot. And that's what has been talked about in all those kinds of cases. Well, once Panini came in, it was really like a masterpiece in that particular job. He created his sutras, put them entirely into a mathematical formula. The work that was started by Kashyapa, Kashyapa has started it earlier. I got some roots of what Kashyapa has done. But Kashyapa's language or methodology was improved upon and brought it to total perfection by um, uh, Panini. And once that was there, a revolution in languages happened. In India, no one ever wrote in Vedic Sanskrit after Panini. Whether it was a Purana, Itihasa, or a Kavya that followed in Sanskrit, or any language that came out, all after that were written in Panini and Sanskrit, something that could be fitted into and was a part of the standard of the Sanskrit. So I say that this standardization of the language of the gods happened at Panini's time and finally signed, sealed and delivered at that particular point, which made it unchangeable from that particular time. We get back to Takshashila again and try to wonder what exactly happened at Takshashila. No discussion on Takshashila is complete without talking about a few uh, historic excavations that have happened especially Miller, for uh, maybe this is for your information. Uh, Upinder Singh, who is a historian, has worked only on that. All the work that has happened at Takshashila, mostly, that's one of them. The other mathematical, mathematician historian who worked on uh, Takshashila was D.D. Kwasambi. And I would like to refer to him to an extent, only marginally. The reason for this is simple. Might be Kosambi was not all that well informed when he worked in the 1950s on Takshashila. He firmly believed in the Aryan invasion theory. So he thought that people who came from the Iranian belt came with their swords in and they started killing everything and spread their culture or sort of wiped out the earlier culture kind of was his concept. This has been questioned and doubted. Now, it was more of an assimilation of cultures rather than fighting and killing over. But very little of that thing happened till about a much later time, something like 7th or 8th century AD. Up to that particular time, it was all a question of assimilation and learning from each other. His work on Takshashila, which runs into some 10 or 20 pages, which I have collected around here, tells about a lot of things that might have happened at the time of uh, in Takshashila. One of the most important things is that Takshashila happens to be a trading town. This was on the trade route, the Sartha route, which runs from Afghanistan and Iran all the way down to the southeast as it comes down, almost up to Mathura and everything else at a later time at least. When they came in at that the sort of a, that phase of time, they, the main purpose of their movement was assimilation, trade, and understanding each other. It is not much, much more. There was no conquest or anything involved, possibly till Alexander came in. Even he possibly didn't conquer any land here. He took a few people with him who were learned and known to him at that particular time. That is what they say about Alexander. That was almost the end of the Takshashila uh, period also. But then the questions about Takshashila are this way. Kosambi has not questioned the authority of Takshashila, excepting he says that it was not a university in the present sense of the term. So it was not a university campus which had different departments and different people going into that kind of a thing. 
he saw, he thought that it was sort of a trading town with an alley or an ally or an area where the learned people, people who were more sort of learned on languages, sat, discussed and went through standardization. Possibly this spread a little in that sense. There were many po more people working on specific trades in this area. So it was a university town rather than a university per se. It was not one building with so many departments associated. It was one town with so many areas specializing in different regions. And possibly this language office supplying the core of media or the mode of communication that was necessary. And that's exactly what possibly we can understand now, even from D.D. Kwasambi's work. It cannot be questioned in that sense. There's no doubt that the language that went by went on improvement, improving itself. It underwent all the changes that were necessary and finally led to the standardized Sanskrit, which was, and the grammar, the Paninian grammar, which bound everything absolutely watertight. Even at that time, there was a lot of exchange of local languages and local, local dialects with the thing. The Buddhist monks who had started working and walking in that particular area were standard visitors to Takshashila. In fact, almost at the end of the Takshashila, the Buddhists and the Jains virtually took over Takshashila University because they were not averse to writing or exchange of information. There was no restrictions so far Buddhists were concerned. And that's how the entire the concepts and the ideas of the language itself changed. Not surprisingly, one of the first major works in Paninian Bhasha, Paninian Bhasha for that matter, happens to be Buddha Charita of Ashoghosha, 2nd century BC. The first known Kavya or an epic poem that has been written. Up to that particular time, possibly most of the other works that existed, existed only as short pieces of songs or poems or poetry, not long things, gathas or sort of uh, little mandalas or sections of the Vedas, not exactly a large episodic sort of kind of a poetry. They were not trying to do that. There has been a lot of dispute and doubt I know about Mahabharata and Ramayana. But even Ra Ramayana and Mahabharata, even at that time, please remember, were written in Vedic, in the refined language only and not in the Vedic language. Might be there were some limitations and possibly it went parallel. These 300 or 400 years of Takshashila also saw many other works of Vedic times being translated into the more intelligible modern language that they were developing, which was under the process of development. That is one of the reasons that we find some of the Upanishads and Brahmanas of that particular time, which are not sort of, uh, not a part of the main archive as it were, were being translated into this language. When we see them today, we see them like in modern or the later Paninian Sanskrit and we need not worry. That's no surprise because they were being translated in parallel. The second level of contribution of the standardized Sanskrit and the grammar on the local languages was tremendous. All the local people, all the local languages started adopting the same kind of technique, the same kind of grammar, again suited both phonetically and convenience wise. It was again assimilation, not just the adoption of that particular grammar, but modifying it to their requirement. The first sort of a big impact was with Prakrit and Pali. The Pali and Prakrit language, as we saw here, I put under the class of language of men, which had a lot of exchange of concepts with the language of the gods. That was the Deva Bhasha of that particular time. 
the refined standardized language that was available at that time and almost had nothing to do with the earlier Vedic or the proto language that existed at that particular time. The Prakrit has not contributed anything to this, but it has contributed to this. That was a continuous exchange of words and all that. I usually give this example as a genetics, example of genetics. In genetics, we know that if the moment a man and woman have a child, the child inherits quite a lot of the properties of the parents, but then also misses on quite a few of the points that come from either. It is a, not an identical clone of the father or the mother. It is sort of a product, a mix of both with all the universals, the basic structure remaining the same, only the external skin changing to whatever it is. And that is what we are going to talk about as the language of men. All the languages, Kannada or Tamil or Telugu or Gujarati or Hindi or Bengali or any other language, Nepali or even the languages as far as Java and Borneo, all those languages also and Indonesia, all of them believed and they sort of added or derived and contributed to an extent to the language of the gods. This was only a question of practice. Someone from here going there and learning that language and applying those principles to his language and also adding a few words to that language of his soul. Possibly one of the classic of such people that happened were the many who went from south, the Shatavahanas, used quite a lot of the Sanskrit words and Sanskrit language in them. The Buddhists changed their Pali drastically into that. Fortunately or unfortunately, this kind of exchange of words stopped approximately after starting of regular universities, like Nalanda itself. After Nalanda started, Nalanda had restrictions on just there was a dress code or there was a restriction on who could come in and who could go out kind of a thing. They say at least as a part of a story that uh, uh, many of the people if they had to go there, they had to convert themselves into Buddhism before entering or entering to the inner of the Nalanda University. In Takshashila, because it was an open structure, all these kind of things were not necessary. Another anecdote too here, Takshaka, the word itself is supposed to mean a carpenter according to the Vedic Sanskrit. So who, what were they carpenting in the 8th century BC? I am quite sure that uh, there were no chisel and hammer or anything of that kind that time. The carpentry only meant taking natural things and making structures which are much, much better than the natural things that exist just by binding them together. What I want to say that Sakshashila did exactly that. Take all the rudimentary words or what the rudimentary grammars that existed or varied grammars that existed all of them were natural languages. From that, create a structure and a perfect methodology by which they can be joined and combined. So, my conclusion for the entire thing is simple. Takshachila finally led to only one thing, creating a Paninian grammar, which forms the basis of all the grammars that existed, that have been created at later times in this kind of a country. That's the standardization that I have to say. I have to say about this kind of a huge kind of an exchange of information, words and grammars. Though the language of the gods itself did not take any contributions to grammar from local languages, it contributed on, only words. They started as Apabramsha and local words or all those kind of things. Kavyadarsha, Dandi in 9th century also talks about the Shaurasini and all other variations of words that have sort of crept into Sanskrit at different times. All those things might have happened. Finally, language of the gods existed in that particular fashion. Language itself can be used in one or two more methods, which I just want to conclude very fast. Takshashila had to standardize on a language for two reasons. One was as a medium of instruction because you, in a, any university or any educational system, you have to have a language which could be understood by everyone 
and can be interpreted by everyone. So that was one of the requirements of a language. You call it still Vyavahara, sort of a day-to-day -day lingua franca, day-to-day -day language that has to exist. Maybe this kind of a language can be used even in trade to an extent, but it is of secondary use. Trade happens by other things. But for a language to be taught and learnt, you need a discipline and that is the minimum of the language discipline they had at that particular time. The second level of discipline is in archiving information. If you have to sort of uh, save some information that is there in a language, you may take it to writing at a later time. But even if you don't write it down, if you speak it out, I have archived a few words and a few thoughts of mine in you now, just because you have heard me and you have understood. This is possible because I was speaking in a language which you could understand and sort of rethink or think the same way as I was thinking about a particular word or associate the same kind of a meaning. So this is possible only if it was I was standardized, possibly if I was speaking in Greek, not that I would understand, but you also would not understand what I was talking. That is the use and approximate necessity of the archiving information. One of the best way of archiving is multiplying information. It is not just writing it down. Printing was a better way of archiving just because you could put multiple copies and you can distribute it with many people. And whatever that happens is true, even about verbal communication or verbal archiving. For this, you need a standard language. That was exactly the essential of that. The third major use of a, a language is in, as an administrative language that again, though it's slightly different than the other things, it's required as an administrative tool. Orders and commands have to be understood and their intensity of the orders and urgency of the orders have to be understood and they have to be appreciated and made sure of. This also forms a part of whatever that was going on. The fourth use, possibly the ritual use, as sort of indicated earlier by our great masters, the ritual use of the language itself as it goes and you can sort of make, uh, sort of pray, pray for gods and all kinds of abstract things can happen which may not have an immediate meaning but it is decorating the language, finally leading to poetry and going for the total abstractions that are possible in the language. The possibilities of developing a very sophisticated language from nothing are there. But only when the ornamented language becomes a part of a common standard language, it helps in creating poetry which will last. Ramayana or Mahabharata had to be written in a language which would be understood by many more at different kinds of times. Or to an extent, even when they standardized on the language of men, Pali or Ardhamagadi, as the standard for Jain and Buddhist works, they followed the virtually the same principle, accepting that life became that much easier because they had a standard to sort of a template of a language on which they could model or reconstruct their language at that particular time. This kind of a process has been well understood and this is the theory or this is exactly what I wanted to say. To do this, I also studied to an extent the way the two or three languages that we have got developed and came into existence. The history of English by Gleason tells about this kind of a thing. How exactly after Johnson's dictionary, there was virtually no change in the language or it got standardized. Chaucer's works in English, you can hardly understand even now unless someone retranslate them into the present language. The language of the earlier time was a huge mixture of many other scripts and many other languages that existed in Europe. But Johnson's standardization sort of fitted the entire thing and it got complete. The thing is true even about German or even to a Latin to an extent. All the standard languages themselves require standardization. And here the anonymous language or the Vedic language or the proto language of that particular time got into a Devabhasha and got a final seal with Panini 
and hardly any changes have occurred. This is one of the important things that I need to say. The second thing that I need to say is uh, something which I will not take much time on it. I will be usually very fast on the second thing. That happens to be a sort of my personal tribute to uh, officially one of the persons who has written a huge thing called officially Shiksha. You have got your piece of paper uh, tomorrow and when it comes to that I will show it by a um, slide anyway. There is a the phoneme or any other thing that we have. Officially Shiksha incidentally talks only about the spoken language. It says that there are so many phonemes that are there. What are the ways that a phoneme could be created? How a sound could be produced to make a spoken language? Obviously, you need a desha, a space and time to do all those kinds of things. It may be rarifying or putting pressure on the air that is around you. That is one of them. Then we have got the time that is, a, as I told you earlier, you can pronounce something in different lengths of time. So you need a certain amount of time to speak something out. Then we also need a prayatna, the bala, a pressure or an intent. This is of two kinds according to officially. The first one is the antaprayatna. There has to be an intention to speak. There has to be a cognitive effort to look for what you have to speak or what sound that you have to produce. That has to come from internal reference to whatever that is there in your brain, which is different in each one's brain. But when I say something, that I has to come from some location in my brain as to what exactly it has to. So there is an effort in involved in picking it up. That is known as the antaprayatna. Then I have to put some pressure on air when the thing comes out from my mouth. That is the Bahya Prayatna, the external effort that I have to put. So the Prayatna is the third element. The fourth element that goes into all these kinds of samjnas or elements that I am going to talk about. I use the word samjna as done by Panini anyway. But the next one happens to be something very odd. That happens to be the Karana, the tool and the equipment. In Apishali's case, he was talking about the human mouth or the vocal cord at the one that generates all sounds. In his theory on Karana, he talks about the different positions in the tongue which produce different levels of sounds. And he sort of stops at that. The word Karana in Sanskrit, as you know, means something more than that. It means a tool or an equipment or whatever that we have got, an artifact in that sense, which can be used. So I thought, this is a sort of a purely personal uh, ex uh, sort of ex exclamation or excavation, you could call it. I was wondering whether this karana could be any other kind of a karana. Can the whole body be a karana? Can a stretch string be a karana? Can a paper and pencil be a karana? Can the stretched skin on a drum, can that be a karana? Technically, the word karana can explain all these kinds of things can be called karanas because once you have got it's possible to use them to produce something of an output. In that case, each of those karanas will have a vyakarana of their own. There will be some rules under which they can be used, they can be combined to communicate as a language. So, we have got a place here to talk about this entire principle as a set of samjnas or elements specific to the kind of mode of language that we have. If we have a language of dance, it may be the different postures of the body that you have. If it is a language of music, it may be the scale of music that you have got at the different karanas, at the part of the karana. You may have used a stress ring then that becomes the different positions become the different positions of the karna. There are rules by which those things can be combined. Even a pen needs to know how it has to move to produce a A or a B or a ka or a ga. All those rules 
which call you call them orthography or simply grammar does not matter once all these kinds of comments that provides a grammar so i say that a karana defines a grammar a vyakarana and when the two are combined it is possible to construct a language or a mode of communication so i call this as an extended officially principle of a language and i am enjoyed doing it that is all that i need to tell you it does not take us very very far it is also possible to put it in a simple mathematical format though it doesn't make much sense as it is so I, that is exactly what i have done in the piece of paper that you carry in your hand it basically says that there can be a grammar for each kind of karana that you have so we have a single way of explaining and understanding all modes of communication as derivatives of a karana and a vyakarana that follows and obviously keeping the other three a constant it say basically to say that a language is not produced accidentally it has to be a deliberate effort by the speaker or the communicator and also there is a very deliberate and specific effort from the person who is receiving to understand what is being talked they use the same grammar it is the same the mirror image of the same reversal of that happens and i have enjoyed sort of uh, moving it into officially extended grammar in that kind of a sense